and start. My name is Tim Holmes, and I am an artist in Helena and a, a solar producer and a general rabble, rabble rouser. I'm also a member of the Sleeping Giant Citizens Council that is putting on this little webinar. We're very glad that there are so many of you here that are interested in going solar. First, we're gonna talk about the Solarize campaign for Helena, what that's all about, who the group is, our timeline, how you can get involved. And then we've got a special guest, Andrew Valenus, who is the executive director of Montana Renewable Energy Association. And he's gonna dive into some real um, uh, solar specific details. But first, just a little bit of Zoom housekeeping information. If you haven't done this before, to submit questions, use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, right down here. You can submit questions at any time during the presentation. We're just gonna go for an hour. So uh, it's gonna go pretty fast. And at the end of our presentations, we're gonna have plenty of time for questions. So please use the Q&A function to submit to questions. You can uh, ask any of the presenters or, or myself. If we don't know the answer, we will, uh, I'll try to resist the temptation to just make up an answer that sounds good. And we'll follow up with you after the webinar. Um, we will also be adding in links and information in the chat window as we go along. So Solarize Helena is a campaign being launched by the Sleeping Giant Citizens Council. And we are a grassroots affiliate of the Northern Plains Resource Council. The Sleeping Giant is a group of volunteers that is just sponsoring this campaign to try to get some information around the Helena area. Uh, for anybody who's, who's interested in, in learning more about the solar projects and what that involves. We are, we are just concerned citizens who are concerned about climate change and doing what we can to make Helena kind of the clean energy showcase for Montana. And we are the ones who kind of spearheaded several of the projects that I'm sure you've heard about by now, helping put solar panels on various uh, places, buildings in and around Helena in the last few years, the Holter Museum, Carroll College. We're working on two elementary schools right now. Uh, we did a big project for the Lewis and Clark Library. And in that case, we actually raised enough money so that there was leftover money to put panels on the libraries in Lincoln and in Augusta. And that's something I'm just really proud of to be able to create a project that has that much extra energy. <laughs> so we've come together to bring more solar power to Helena and to make Helena a leader in solar, to make it easier for our community members to install solar in their homes or businesses. And of course, all of this is dedicated to the, to the major issue of fighting climate change. If you're not a member of the Northern Plains Resource Council or Sleeping, Science, Sleeping Giant Citizens Council, we welcome you to join the movement as we advocate for a healthy, inviting, and sustainable community to improve local access to renewable energy options in Helena and to work to protect clean air and clean water from carbon intensive energy sources, of which unfortunately Montana is a bad example. Um, before we introduce Andrew, on the, some of the specifics of solar energy, we'll, we'll do a brief, a brief overview of the campaign uh, to help plan our community um, to, to get our teeth around this solar issue. Uh, Solarize Helena is a short-term local effort that brings together groups of potential solar customers through outreach and education. And this helps us to find solar installation companies that, that are offering competitive transparent pricing. 
By collaborating as a community interested in solar, we break down the barriers to accessing, to accessing solar. This includes making solar less technical by bringing information and talking about questions with peers. We'll also join together to determine the criteria that we want from installers to work to get the lowest price possible. So solarized campaigns are actually offered nationwide. They started in Oregon and the campaign has resulted in thousands of new installations all over the country. A recent Yale study found that there have been solarized campaigns in at least 25 states. In Montana, we've had them in Missoula, Livingston, Red Lodge and Billings. They've all led campaigns over the last few years. And this year there's campaigns beside in Helena, also in Glendive and Lewistown. We started this campaign here early this year by reaching out to installers. And we're now focusing our outreach to bring interested solar, cust solar customers to the table. And we've selected our installer for Helena, who's our, our single local solar business installer, which is Solar Montana. And uh, we start uh, site assessments this summer and fall. And an assessment is when the solar installer visits your home or your business and determines if you meet the criteria for installation. And that includes like things like sun exposure, roof structure, annual energy use, et cetera. And from that assessment, the installer can schedule an installation with you and get your solar up and running. And when I did it a few years ago, man, it happened in one day and the next day I turned it on and am making my own power. In fact, in my art studio here, I make so much power that I give it away because it's more than I can use. So if you need to plug in your car or something, bring it over. If you're ready to sign up for an, an assessment right now, you, you certainly can. We're gonna um, put all the information in the chat here. So there's no charge for the assessment, it's free. Though we do ask for your patience because Solar Montana is only one business and it's trying to accommodate a number of customers throughout the summer and fall. Uh, the links to sign up for that assessment will, is in the chat here. So to begin with, um, I'm gonna turn it over to McKenna. She's gonna ask for a quick poll and she promises it's not gonna be like personal questions. It's just about the solar issue. So McKenna, fire away. Sure, thank you. And just to quickly introduce myself, McKenna Sellers. I'm the legislative organizer for Northern Plains and the staff person for Sleeping Giant Citizens Council. Pleasure to be with you all this evening. So um, we've got just kind of a get to know you poll that I'm going to launch right now. And it's, uh, it asks, you know, what brings you to this Solarize Helena webinar? And we'll give you, oh, maybe about 30 seconds to fill this out. So if you're on a computer tonight, you're able to um, vote with us and then we'll broadcast the results in just a few minutes or a few seconds. I'll put on a little uh, music. Did you get a bunch of responses? I can't. We've got quite a few. Let's give it 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Five, four. I feel like we have conflicting things going on here, Tim, but I do appreciate the musical interlude. All right, I'll end the poll. So this is what we got. Let me see, share results. The vast majority of folks are interested in going solar in the very near future and want to learn more. And a shout out to those current solar owners. You are amazing. And we might even have a role for you in this campaign. But Thought you all might like to know about that. And we'll pass the mic over to Andrew Valinas from Montana Renewable Energy Association. Thank you, Andrew. Great. Um, thank you, McKenna, and thank you, Tim. Um, 
both for the invitation to be here today and for the, um, the musical entertainment. Um, appreciate that as well, Tim. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Andrew Valanis. Um, I'm the executive director of the Montana Renewable Energy Association. And I was invited here tonight to talk to you about the basics of going solar. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to share my screen. And if I could get a thumbs up, maybe from Tim to make sure you can see my screen is the presentation. Great. Yep. Love getting a thumbs up. All right. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to talk about, I'm going to dive right in um, because I want to leave as much time for questions um, as I can. So really quickly about MREA, um, we are a nonprofit organization uh, founded 20 years ago in the year 2000, 2001. Um, and we uh, educate and advocate for renewable energy um, across the state. So uh, we work a lot actually with Northern Plains, especially on legislative advocacy, um, great partnership and um, uh, always excited to collaborate and support each other's work. So I'm excited to be presenting to Northern Plains tonight. <clears throat> um, MRA does a lot of education and outreach work. Um, we do a lot of community events. Uh, we actually partner with Sleeping Giant on the Sun Run every year and put on uh, kind of a co-event, um, doing some educational work during the Sun Run event, which is always fun for us. Um, we do legislative and regulatory work, like I mentioned. So I hang out with McKenna in the hallways uh, up in Helena, running around chasing down legislators. Um, we, MREA also works at the PSC, um, providing comments and intervening when necessary. Um, <clears throat> and we do a lot of industry engagement. And this is kind of what is unique about MREA compared to some other advocacy groups in the state is a lot of our members are renewable energy installers. And so we're not a trade association by any, by any means or by any kind of definition, but um, we do kind of do some of the work that a trade association might do, um, looking out for some of the industry concerns that aren't necessarily covered by other um, advocacy groups and organizations. Um, <clears throat> so diving in, um, just to get everyone up on the same page, I always like going over some energy basics so that when we're using certain terminology, everyone knows what we're talking about. So uh, when we're talking about um, renewable energy and, and energy and power, uh, there, there's two different things. There's power and there's energy. Um, power is measured in watts and it's how much work something does. And this is typically what you'll see um, kind of the rating on an appliance or on a solar panel or things like that um, is how much work can this thing do? <clears throat> so a thousand watts, you can convert into a kilowatt. And that's probably one of the more, actually one of the most used terms when we talk about kind of energy and power is the kilowatt. Um, if you take uh, the amount of power something does and measure it over time, that's how you get energy. So energy is measured in watt hours. And similarly, if you use a thousand watt hours, you get a kilowatt hour. So kilowatt and kilowatt hour um, are two similar and related items uh, when we're talking about how much energy you're using. Um, just a basic example, if you use one watt for two hours, you get two watt hours. Um, or if you use a thousand watts for two hours, you get two, uh, 2000 watt hours, which is two kilowatt hours. Um, for frame of reference, we're talking about rooftop solar tonight. Um, your average rooftop solar system is probably around five kilowatts, maybe six or seven. Um, and for reference, coal strip unit four is 740 megawatts. And a megawatt is a thousand kilowatts. So, you know, very, very different scale as far as how much energy you're um, using or producing. Um, thinking about energy and how much you're using at home. Uh, if you use a microwave and heat up dinner for five minutes, you could use about 0.05 kilowatt hours. Um, if you're watching a football game, you know, uh, using your TV for about four hours, maybe you're using 0.2 kilowatt hours. And the interesting thing about the energy equation is that it applies to both using energy and producing energy um, with some small differences, but for all intents and purposes, it's, it's relatively the same. So if you're looking at a 300 watt solar panel producing for six hours, um, there's an efficiency factor in there that you have to include as well, but um, you're looking at about a third of a kilowatt hour. So um, you could power that uh, football, you could watch that football game with your solar panel uh, and you'd be good to go. Um, <clears throat> question I get a lot, does Montana have a good solar resource, especially for us over here in Missoula and up in the Flathead, I get a lot of questions about how cloudy it gets. Um, the answer is flatly and very uh, definitively, yes, we have a good solar resource. Um, it's actually comparable to places like Florida and Germany, 
Um, Germany is the worldwide leader in, in installed solar. Um, and it's pretty uh, even across the state. So um, despite you know, some cloudy winters in the Western part of the state, um, our long summer days really make up for it on an annual cycle. And you can see that um, in this chart down at the bottom here, <clears throat> those blue bars and the orange bars, um, that graph came from a report that Montana's Department of Environmental Quality did uh, about the solar resource in Montana and how it compares to other communities across the country. So, you know, we're not going to have the same solar resources places like Napa, California or Phoenix, Arizona, where it's incredibly sunny right down here in that dark red area. Um, but if you look at this nice orange that we have all across Montana, um, we really do have a good solar resource and we compare well to places that have um, big solar markets, um, which is, you know, a good opportunity for Montana. Um, so how do you shop for renewable energy? I always, I, I like showing this slide, even though you're part of a solarized program. Um, one of the best parts of a solarized program is it simplifies this entire process. But the nice thing about the process is it's kind of simple to begin with. Um, there aren't that many steps and you can make it as complicated as you want. You can really get into the weeds and do a lot of data crunching and things like that, or you can keep it really straightforward and simple. Um, and kind of lean on your installer to do a little more of the data crunching, um, which a lot of them do. So your first step is gathering information and whether or not you do any, you know, you don't necessarily need to build an Excel spreadsheet, um, but it's always good to think through some preliminary questions like, do you have a location in mind? Um, do you wanna be on grid or off grid? What is your budget? Um, what are your energy goals? And are those goals going to change? Um, your solar installer, is going to ask you for um, a few energy bills, ideally a copy of your energy bills for the last 12 months so they can look at your annual energy use. And that helps them understand how to size the system to fit your needs. But you also need to let them know if those needs are going to change. Do you plan on um, adding an electric vehicle to your home where you know there's going to be more charging? Um, is one of your children moving off to college so there's going to be less energy used in the home? Um, are you going to switch to from a gas uh, water heater to an electric? Are you installing a hot tub? You know, anything that's going to change your energy use, especially in any significant way, you should bring up with the installer so they can help understand what your energy needs are and how they're going to change so they can size your system appropriately. Um, the second step is contacting a local installer. Luckily, as part of a solarized program, your local installer has already been contacted for you, which is great, simplifies the process. Um, and they'll come out and do a site assessment, which Tim already uh, described, um, which is, you know, always helpful. They look for things like shading, make sure your roof support is there, like Tim said, and kind of all those other things. Um, then you're going to review costs and financing. So does the cost of the system meet your budget? Um, what tax credits and financing options are available that you might want to take advantage of? And I'll talk about some of those later in the presentation. Um, as far as costs go with the program, one of the things that's great about um, participating in a solarized program is, um, in, in my understanding and experience, you're never necessarily guaranteed the most rock bottom price. You know, it's, it's never going to be, um, or, or it might not necessarily be, you know, the, this insanely good price, but it's going to be a great price and it's going to be a good price. And you're going to feel confident accepting that price because it's part of this larger program. And that's always one of the biggest benefits. It's like with any contractor, you know, if you go out and you reach out to four or five different contractors for bids and you get different pricing, you know, you're not necessarily sure which one is the best. And so what do you do? You normally ask friends or family and try and get more info. The Solarize program is great because it cuts through all that and says, like, this is the price for the program, um, which is great. Or maybe it's um, I've seen programs where there's a range of prices depending on the features you go with. Um, so it's, it's something you can trust, which is always really helpful. Um, then you sign your contract and the installation begins. Um, that installation is going to depend on a number of factors like weather, the installer schedule, um, and then of course inspections, um, paperwork with the utility. Um, you have to go back and forth a little bit with applications and things like that. So that will take a little bit of time. Um, and then you have to wait for your net meter to be installed if you're net metering. Um, so there are some other kind of steps involved. Um, but for the most part, your installer, of course, will walk you through all of that. Um, and make sure that you're you're happy with the process. And then, like Tim said, the great thing is at the end of all of it, you get to produce your own energy. Um, and it just lasts for years and years and years, which is a really great thing. 
Um, so some basics you should know going into it. Um, panels are about, you know, six, seven feet by uh, four feet or by three and a half to four feet um, for a 72 cell panel. Um, the rated capacities these days are about 300 to 350 watts. And for your typical residential system, you're probably looking at about 10 to 15 panels on your roof. Um, I looked at a 5KW array in Helena using the National Renewable Energy Laboratory's um, PV Watts tool. The link is there uh, on the screen. Um, it's a really fun tool that lets you estimate how much production you'll get. Um, <clears throat> your solar installer, of course, will have accurate estimates for you um, as part of the process. But if you're looking to do some research yourself, I really like the PV Watts tool. Um, I use it for as my go-to source of information. It's definitely very reliable. Um, and in Helena, you're looking at about 6,500 kilowatt hours a year average. You know, there's there's going to be wiggle room there, but that's kind of a ballpark estimate that you can use. Um, so you can start, you know, basic understanding of how much you're going to produce versus how much you might need to produce. Um, and the, the tool, the online tool is great, it's free, um, and it's kind of fun to play with. So um, I think the address I used for Helena was actually the Capitol building. So um, maybe it's wishful thinking that they'll install solar at the Capitol building, but you never know. Um, another thing you might think about is actually um, ground mounted versus pole mounted. Um, for those who are interested, rooftop solar is obviously a great option. Um, pole mounted has its benefits, but it does add a little bit of cost for the mounting structure. Um, so that's another consideration that you want to ask your installer. Um, and of course, I was just remembering that I, I jumped the gun on my slide. So um, <laughs> locating or setting your array, like I just talked about, rooftop versus ground mounted. Um, shading, of course, you want to be careful about shading. Um, that photo there on the left of that uh, tree cover um, blocking those solar panels, that will affect your production, absolutely. Um, so. It's something to consider. Um, your solar professional is definitely going to look for that. They'll help you figure out a solution to get around it. Um, you know, sometimes it could be something as easy as trimming a branch back uh, once in a while, and that could be a really easy solution. Um, sometimes you may just need to consider a different location on the roof, or you know, consider a ground-mounted location. Um, your installer is also going to look at your roof angle and your roof support, uh, like Tim talked about, um, as far as kind of when they when they come do the site assessment. Um, and this other picture on the right here, you know, in Montana, this isn't necessarily um, indicative of Montana, but in general, you know, the sun is lower in the sky over the winter and higher in the sky over the summer. So for fixed um, panels, meaning they don't rotate or move throughout the year, which is what most rooftop solar panels are, um, you kind of pick an optimal angle, which your ins installer will figure out um, and install them on the roof to capture the most sun and the best production on an annual cycle for you. So they'll figure all of that out. Um, but for those who are wondering, you know, do you kind of pick the happy medium right in the middle um, and, and get the best production that you can throughout the year? Um, like Tim talked about, and actually I think my data is now out of date compared to Tim's, uh, the cost of solar is just dropping incredibly fast, um, which is a great thing and, and on all different scales. So utility scale, community scale, um, you know, residential, we're seeing the cost just drop like crazy, which is a great thing. So um, now is a great time to go solar for sure. Um, and I think you're all going to get probably a, a good price that I think you're going to be happy with. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk about some financing and incentives. So one of the biggest ones to consider and know about is the federal investment tax credit, um, or what we call the ITC. And it's a um, um, a non-refundable tax credit that you can claim uh, for the installation of an alternative energy system, which includes rooftop solar. Right now, uh, you can get 26% off of the total cost. Um, that includes uh, equipment, labor, everything, all of the total cost. Um, my understanding, and I, you know, if you want to follow up with me, I can confirm, but um, my understanding of the tax credit is that if you also install storage at the same time, um, you can apply the 26% to the storage as well. Um, that may be a bit next level for um, kind of what's going on with, with the Solarize program. I think a lot of you are probably focusing just on the solar first, um, but that's something to consider, um, especially in the future, uh, if you're looking to add storage to your system as well. Um, <clears throat> this tax credit is going to step down. It was actually supposed to step down to 22% 
um, this year, but they extended it um, until 2023. So in 23, it'll step down to 22%. And in 2024, the commercial system will step down to 10%. Um, and the residential systems, it will step down to 0%. So it's going away. Um, I always get a lot of questions about whether or not I think it's going to be extended again, um, and again, and again. And, you know, you never know, it's been extended a few different times. It's if you look at the data, it's one of the most successful tax credits, I think, as far as achieving its purpose and what it was meant to do. Um, so it's been kept on the books for a while because it's still it's still doing what it's supposed to do and still helping, um, which is a good thing. But now is definitely a good time to go solar. Um, so I'm glad that you are all considering doing so. <clears throat> um, some other financing and incentives. Um, in addition to the federal tax credit, there is currently a Montana state tax credit you can get $500 per individual or up to $1,000 per household. Um, in their infinite wisdom, the Montana legislature repealed this tax credit this year, um, not without a lot of opposition, um, including from MREA and I believe Northern Plains as well. Um, and that's gonna be effective in 2022. Um, so if you install your system this year, you can still claim that tax credit, but if you don't install the system until next year, um, you won't be able to claim the credit anymore. Um, so that credit is going away. Um, <clears throat> there are a number of loan options in the state. Um, there's three in particular worth noting. The first is from the state energy office at the Department of Environmental Quality. It's called the Alternative Energy Revolving Loan Program. Um, you can get up to $40,000. It's three and a half percent this year, I believe, uh, the same as last year. Um, it's a uh, secured loan, um, but it's a really good program. And I would, from what I know, uh, in talking to installers, a lot of people use that program. Um, so it's a really good option for you. Um, there's a second loan option from a, a local credit union called Clearwater Credit Union. They're headquartered uh, in Missoula, Montana, but they have um, uh, kind of range or service territory in other counties as well. And they have their home solar loans. Um, you can get up to $25,000 at 3.9%. Um, I believe they're unsecured or I, I may have those backwards. Um, but those two are really, they're actually quite comparable. Um, I know the, the dollar amounts and the percentages look different, um, but with kind of fees and applications and stuff like that, um, they're, they're worth comparing for your personal needs to see which one you wanna go with. Um, but, but they're both very good options. And then of course there's the city of Helena is actually very special in that they have a um, their own uh, zero interest renewable energy loan program. You can get up to $12,000. Um, it's zero interest um, and it gets paid back on your property tax bills. Um, and they are revamping, the city of Helena is revamping their website on that program. So there is more information available hopefully soon, um, but you can get in touch with Patrick Judge at the city of Helena to ask any questions you have about that. Um, I know Jack Isbell at Solar Montana also knows about the program. Um, I think the one drawback is the, um, the dollars get used up pretty quick because obviously who doesn't want a zero interest loan? Um, so you need to kind of jump on it, but um, that is an option that is available. Um, <clears throat> there's also a grant um, option uh, for certain qualifying individuals, uh, the Rural Energy for America program. Um, I believe it's mostly for uh, small businesses, um, but you can get up to 25% of the project cost um, uh, right off the top, which is great. So uh, you can reach out to USDA. Um, there's a website that they have all about the program and they have staff all around the state. Um, you do have to be in a qualifying rural area. Um, I think Billings is the only one that, only place in Montana that doesn't qualify as rural uh, per the USDA um, standards. So I think you're all in good shape there. Um, and then thanks to the incredibly hard work by Northern Plains um, over a number of years uh, and including special shout out to McKenna because I was there watching her sprint around the hallways. Um, commercial Property Assessed Clean Energy or CPACE is coming soon to Montana. So um, I am not the expert on that, Northern Plains is, but um, that bill passed this session and uh, huge congratulations to McKenna and Northern Plains for all of that. So you can ask Sleeping Giant and uh, McKenna and, and the Northern Plains folks about CPACE. Um, I will I will plug MREA's website there at the bottom that has more detailed information about all of these options. The only one that we don't have on that website is the um, City of Helena loan 
And of course, see pace just because it's so new, we don't have the info yet. So um, McKenna, when you get all that info, you'll have to send it over to me so I can add it to our to our website. Um, let's see. <clears throat> Something I want to mention before wrapping up here um, is net metering. So if you followed the legislature and if you followed energy at the legislature, you may have heard of net metering before. Um, net metering is a um, it's a it's a billing mechanism. It's a type of billing that allows anyone with a distributed generation system and distributed generation meaning something like rooftop solar, small wind, um, geothermal, micro hydro, things like that. Um, if you are ever producing more energy than you're using, you can export that energy out onto the grid and you can get a credit on your bill for the energy uh, for, for that excess energy. So say I'm, you know, it's the middle of the day and I'm off at work and my solar panels are producing, um, my energy flows out onto the grid, the extra energy, um, and it goes right to my neighbors for them to use. Now the utility gets to sell that energy to them, um, and but you get a bill credit on your bill on your next statement. Um, you can use those for up to 12 months and each year on your 12 month kind of cycle, um, you forfeit any excess energy that you have back to the utility. Um, one thing I'll mention is that you can typically pick from one of four uh, true updates is what they call them. Um, and I always recommend choosing the April date. I think you're allowed to pick January, April, uh, July, or October. Um, picking April is the best because you can start your clock right when the days are getting longer. So you can build up more credits um, and then use them over the winter. Um, and kind of run down your, your piggy bank of solar credits. Um, so the April one is always the one to go with. Uh, MREA has a lot of information about net metering on our website. It's one of our primary policy um, uh, focuses up at the legislature, um, but it's a great program that you should be aware of. Um, and I think you should all certainly participate in it. Um, it really helps with the financing um, of the, of the uh, system as well and, and helps with the payback times too. Um, yeah, just one last plug for the MREA website. Um, a lot of the information I presented today, if you go on our site um, and right on our homepage, we have um, the top level navigation there where it says learn. You can find a whole bunch of, there's a whole drop down menu of um, educational pages about all of this in uh, different topics. Um, and you can also find it right under our work there on the homepage as well. Um, and of course, I'll share my contact information is here. Um, I'll leave it with McKenna um, as well. And you're all welcome to contact me. But um, yeah, I think that's it for my presentation. Um, so I'll stop sharing and pass it back to Tim and McKenna. I think I'm seeing some Q&A come in. So I'll sit and wait for your questions. Great. Thank you so much, Andrew. That's, that's really helpful to have an expert like you that can answer those kinds of questions. The one thing I wanted to add was you mentioned the sun run. Um, that's a collaboration that the Sleeping Giant Citizens Council does every year with the vigilante runners. And we, we create this, uh, this run event in the fall that, that serves as a fundraiser to, to raise most of the money that we need to, uh, to foster these solar projects that we've been supporting in Helena. So uh, we're gonna take some questions. We've got about 20 minutes to cover questions. So any questions you have about uh, any of these projects, technical or otherwise, just put them in the Q&A box down here. And if you have any questions about fashion or hairstyle, those can be directed to me. That's, that's my expertise, of course. Um, and if we're unable to answer questions, we will, we will, refuse to make up an answer as, uh, as would be the temptation, but we will get back to you later because we are pretty serious about um, making sure that, that the information is accurate that you get. So I'm gonna turn back to McKenna, maybe. Um... Yeah, absolutely. We've got a few questions coming in. And so everyone knows we have, um, we are recording this session and we will make it available to you all. I know that Andrew's presentation is, is really rock solid and there's so much information to digest. So we will have that um, available to you all. And um, 
we'll send that along to participants once the recording is up and running. But to get started here, and it looks like mm, the majority of these questions will be for Andrew, but um, we can start with one from Greg and Wendy Wheeler. Andrew, how many years would a typical residential installation last? Yeah, um, <clears throat> great question. And that's definitely a popular one. Um, so typically your installation is warranted for 25 years. Um, and that actually has more to do with um, the inverter and maybe some of the other equipment and not the panels themselves. Uh, the panels will last decades. Um, I always tell people a story. Um, if you're driving to Helena uh, from Missoula along the Little Blackfoot, um, there's a little solar panel that powers a stoplight on the train tracks. And uh, one of the cells, there's a bullet hole in it um, and it's still producing energy. So they're pretty durable. Um, they last for a long time. Um, so, you know, they'll last, yeah, years and years and years. Um, you know, you may have to replace something else after maybe 10 or 15 years, um, something like your inverter, but um, they're normally warranted for about up to 25. And my understanding is that as a panel gets old, the, the production just, just diminishes a little bit. So it could be that in 50 years, you know, they're working at 80% instead of 100% or something like that. And of course, sometimes they, they fail entirely, but it's a, you know, there, there's not a real hard answer for that kind of question. Yeah, Tim, that's right. Everything I've heard from installers, um, you know, the, the drop-off is pretty nominal over, over time, um, but it certainly happens. Um, and like you said, you know, occasionally, just like any piece of equipment, um, one might fail and, and you can get it replaced. Um, but, but hopefully for the most part, um, and from what I've understood, they, they just kind of keep on trekking, which is great. Great, thank you. So we see a couple of questions here about um, durability. Of course, we live in Montana, we know the weather that we get. And so there's questions here about how durable are the panels what are the problems that people see with hail damage and how do we remove snow from solar panels or dust? Yeah, <clears throat> um, yeah let's talk about weather. So um, as far as durability and hail, um, they will stand up to hail very well. They're designed to do so. Um, I think I had one installer um, at, a, at a trade show or something like that. They set up a panel and had people throw baseballs at it as kind of a demonstration. Um, they, they really are tested very strongly. Um, so they will stand up to hail. Um, they've actually, there have been stories of uh, hailstorms that have ripped up, you know, people's roofs, done a significant amount of damage, um, but somebody with solar panels on the roof, they actually took the panels off to repair the rest of the roof and the, the area under the panels was completely fine. Um, so it actually protected their roof, if, if you want to look at it that way. So um, yeah, hail, they hold up really well too. Um, generally, they'll kind of protect your roof that way. Um, Rain is actually good for them. It can kind of, you know, clean them off a little bit from dust and, and you know, leaves and other stuff like that. Um, snow, um, you, you can get up there and push the snow off if you want to. Um, you don't have to. Um, for light snow, you know, something like a dusting, um, it'll actually melt off for the most part. Um, and, you know, if the pitch of the panels are at a certain angle, depending on what your roof is like, um, once the panels warm up a little bit, all the snow will just kind of slide off naturally. Um, if it's a really low angle, some people will hop up on their roof with a brush and push it off. Um, it really kind of, that, that's a bit of a personal decision. Um, obviously, as a disclaimer, I'll say if you're climbing up on your roof, be safe, um, use the appropriate equipment. Um, but yeah, people kind of make their own decision there. But for the most part, unless it's, you know, a foot of snow, which we certainly get in Montana, um, a lot of it kind of takes care of itself, which is really nice. I'm thinking about a question that we got from Greg in Augusta before the webinar even started. So uh, Brownie points to Greg for giving us a pre-question, but he wanted to know about off-grid systems and how to what the next steps are there and how you determine if you want an on-grid or off-grid system. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think that the, first of all, the process is all the same, right? You're still thinking about what, you know, if you think back to that slide I had up there, um, what are your energy goals? What are your needs? Um, what's your budget like? Things like that. Then you, you know, contact your installer um, <clears throat> and think about, you know, what they're offering and, and walk through the site assessment and everything like that. The big difference is obviously you don't have the grid there 
to help you out if if um, the you know overnight or if the sun isn't producing so um, or if the solar isn't producing so from all of the kind of off grid experts that I've talked to the biggest consideration is less about um, how much energy you use and more about when you're using that energy so it's a little bit more of energy management than it is um, you know the number of appliances that you have so if you're starting to think about off grid living and not really sure where to start. Um, I actually recommend reaching out to the folks at uh, the Sage Mountain Center. Um, Chris, Christopher Borton there, um, they've been doing kind of off-grid education and, and have some information. They've been doing that for a long time. Um, MREA is also, I'm working on developing um, uh, an informational page like we have on our website for solar PV and um, small wind and stuff about off-grid living, but we just don't have it ready yet. Um, but folks like Chris at Sage Mountain Center, um, really good experts on Kind of getting you going on how to start thinking about off-grid living and, and managing your energy use um you know you think about something like uh, a space heater um uses a whole lot of energy all at once so if you're going to use something like that you want to try and do it during the day um, versus overnight if you can limit your loads to just lighting um you can you know probably ride through the night on storage um pretty easily so you know there are a couple different considerations there but um it's all you're talking, definitely you're talking about uh, when you're off the grid, you have to make those considerations when you're off the grid. When you're on the grid, you don't have to worry about that stuff. Right, right? correct. Right. Yep. Okay. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Yep. This is somewhat of a combo question, but feels relevant today. So question from Matt about the biggest hurdles that keep people from installing solar. Uh, the things that we've observed, and Andrew, you could tie into this too, but it's typically the the upfront cost of the financing or the social inertia, um, or both. You know, it's usually a mix of a number of things. But um, in some cases, if you're going to be grid tied, maybe you don't use enough energy, and your house is more like a natural. You use more gas in the winter and not as much electricity, so it wouldn't make quite as much sense for your home to go solar because you're just a a smaller energy user. But that ties into another question here we have about, um, is it better for a hot water furnace to install a solar hot water system instead of a photovoltaic? Um, <clears throat> great question. And to the previous question, McKenna, I think you're right on um, with those answers for sure. Um, I think, boy, I, I think that's a really personal um, question about kind of the hot water heater versus solar, solar hot water. Um, God, there's so many different, I feel like hot water technologies these days, um, even just from when I was first working for NCAT like a decade ago. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's worth researching both. I, I can't recommend one or over the other, um, especially because I, it's kind of a cop out. But, um, you know, when you talk about energy, it, it is kind of personal, right? Um, it, it's, it's how much you use in your home. It, it's very much tied to your lifestyle. Um, and so it's hard to recommend it without kind of understanding more about, you know, how, what your day-to-day -day routines are like and how many people are in your house, you know, and things like that. So um, my, my, I guess, template answer is it's definitely an option worth exploring. Um, and there are installers in the state that do hot water heaters, uh, solar, solar hot water uh, in particular. So um, I recommend looking up a couple of them and giving them a call and, and talking to them. And we have a, um, uh, I didn't show it on the website because the Solarize program, you already have your installer picked, but um, we do host a directory of renewable energy installation businesses on MREA's website. Um, and you can uh, find ones that install uh, solar thermal and solar hot water and give them a call. All the contact information is all there. Awesome, thanks, Andrew. Um, Tim or Andrew, you might know this one, but for Helena, what's or even just Montana, do we know what the average payback period is for for our state and just looking at the prices on average? Yeah, Tim, I don't know what your personal experience is or was, um, but what I hear from installers, average is like 10 to 15 years right now, um, which is actually really good. Uh, that's comparable to other states. Um, I think the the like golden egg in the industry is under 10 years. That's pretty great for especially if you think of it as just a financial investment, um, you know, just even aside from other reasons that you might be installing solar, um, under 10 is really good. And 
Um, I think we're seeing kind of 10 to 15. Um, Montana has actually high electricity prices for our region, um, but low compared to other places in the country. Um, you know, places like, you know, I, I grew up in New England where the cost of electricity is, you know, 20 something cents per kilowatt hour, which is, you know, two, two and a half times what we're paying. So their payback times are very different compared to what ours are. Um, but, you know, out here, I think we're seeing about 10 to 15. And just on top of that, uh, what that means is, you know, after 10 or 15 years, all the power you produce is, is essentially money you're making. And so for the whole life of the system, it's going to keep, uh, keep running down your, your bill. I just um, was in a conversation with a church in Bozeman that put up a system that's about 50 kilowatts. And they, they crunched some numbers and discovered that the, the total um, harvest of energy that they're gonna create over the lifetime of the system is almost a quarter of a million dollars. And this is a system that cost them, the total cost was 90,000. And after the grants and stuff that they were able to get, you know, it was less than $20,000. So it's an incredible investment uh, in certain cases. Excellent. Okay, we've got time for a few more questions here. So I'm seeing some, um, here's a good one. If, if the homeowner wants to look at their monthly electricity usage, is that something that Northwestern posts online or something that you could request? And actually, I mean, Tim, do you want to, because you probably took a look at this. Do you want to take a crack at this? First? Yeah, it's really easy to go online and see the last year of your, uh, of your usage, either gas or, or electric. Uh, they post that for everybody. And I believe that if you if you want a longer record than that, say the last few years, I think the company can provide that to you as well. Yep, that's right. I think you have to set up a, a free account online just to have a username and password, but it's really easy. I've, I've done it. Um, and also, you know, if you have just your monthly paper bills, um, you know, those will do too. If you've got 12 of those hanging around, um, you know, you can do it that way as well. Okay, I think that our installer, Jack in Solar Montana might have more to say about this one, but Tesla tiles, what about Tesla tiles? Can we use those as a replacement for roofing shingles? Is that a viable technology for us to roll out here? Um, any thoughts on the current condition there? Um, my understanding is, is the Tesla tiles, um, I, I haven't heard of them coming to Montana yet. Um, we tend to get Kind of those cutting edge technologies a little later than than other states do there's a bit of a lag in the market here just because the market is smaller um the kind of general solar market in montana is smaller um uh and yeah I, i'm i'm kind of well i guess i'll leave it at that um i'm not an installer uh so i don't i haven't researched the technology as much as maybe one of them has so i'll, I'll refrain from commenting on the actual technology itself um but i I do feel like I've heard a bunch of hiccups of the actual rollout of the technology, um, but it's you know I I think the upshot is I haven't really seen it in Montana yet. I don't I don't know that it's really I don't know of any contractors offering them. I guess is my point. Um, but if somebody calls me tomorrow and tells me they're offering them, I will uh, stand corrected. So very good. And here's another good one where. We've got about 10 minutes to the end here and we only have a few minutes of close. So if there are final questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A box here. But um, Dan is looking at building a new home. When should he start thinking about the solar process? That's a good question. Oh, great question. The answer is right now. Yeah, do it right now for sure. Um, you can, there, there are really small things you can do when you're at the design phase of any building. Um, that will make installing solar easier on the installer, um, cheaper for you, and just a win-win all around. Um, roof angle, roof support, roof orientation, um, location of your electrical box, um, just access to wiring and running conduit, um, you know, orientation of the entire building if you have that option. Make it, you know, make sure there's a nice big south-facing area that doesn't have any tree shade next to it. Um, there are a lot of different things you can do that are 
really easy for the architect um, and save you a lot of money in the long run. So I, I would definitely bring it up in the design process um, sooner rather than later. And I should say, um, uh, you can make all those shifts and changes for really not much additional cost. Like the sooner you do it, the more likely it is that it won't really cost you any more and will only end up saving you money, which is obviously a win-win. Great, thank you, Andrew. We've got, we have one question here about the city of Helena potentially pursuing some energy independent, um, like larger energy, like a, a solar array. I'm not sure if, I haven't heard that before, but it sounds interesting. And so we'll, we'll keep an ear out and that might be a good question for our sustainability coordinator at the city of Helena, Pat Judge. But I think maybe the answer, oh, they, go ahead. Weren't they trying to get a, a solar array on the parking garage or the uh, something like that, a city, city parking building? Yeah, and it sounds like that's happening. So Northwestern Energy buzz, budgets a fair amount of money for some energy innovation projects and they've partnered with the city of Bozeman for that. Um, they've partnered with city of Missoula and now they're looking at Helena and yeah, I see in the chat here, it's the, it's the city transportation shop. And so it's, it's the Northwestern energy ear earmarked funding for uh, USB. So not quite the same as a uh, electricity independence, but certainly a step in the right direction. Um, the other question here is. Well, McKenna, that may have, that may have been tied back to, um, some of the collaborative work with City of Missoula and Missoula County and City of Bozeman as well, I'm not sure. Um, but I know there's some collaborative work going on there on the green tariffs um, and also just kind of general clean electricity goals. So um, it, it's great to see, I, you know, it's, it's exciting to see different communities around the state have these goals, but I think it's even more exciting to see them kind of collaborate with the utility um, or, or, you know, pushing the utility to kind of help them reach those goals. So um, yeah, really exciting. And I know, I think Northern Plains and Sleeping Giant were really integral in the Helena effort. So um, thank you all for doing that. All right. Well, we are close to the end of our hour here. Tim, do you wanna give us the, the close? Thank you everyone for the excellent questions. Yeah. Uh, and thank you, Andrew, Andrew for all these great uh, uh, technical specs that that really helps uh, fill out <laughs> the, the information that, that we're able to give with the Sleeping Giant Committee. Um, one thing, there was, there was a question in the chat about when what the replay of this webinar is gonna be available. McKenna, do you know when that's gonna be? Yeah, we'll, we'll have our recording up as soon as this week or early next, and we can notify all attendees when that's available. Great, and, and then we've got a website that is almost up, right? Won't that be available in the next week or so? Yeah, there's gonna be more information where we'll include all of, uh, all of what we covered tonight. So as far as if people are looking for what to do next, sign up for our assessment or join Sleeping Giant and be a part of the movement, like Tim said. So put that on the screen and I can give you all the assessment link one more time. Yeah, so that should be in the chat there. So thank you everybody for participating in this. Um, remember to sign up for the, for the assessment on that, on that link in the chat. And if you have any additional questions about Solarize Helena, about, about the, uh, any of these technical issues, um, you can either email McKenna at the email address that she's putting in the chat, or you can get a hold of Andrew or me, although I'm not as much of an expert as Andrew is. Um, I also talked to Jack Isbell of Solar Montana, who's gonna be our installer. He couldn't come tonight, but he is certainly available for questions too. Uh, he's really looking forward to this project and, and he's full of all kinds of information. And just as, as kind of a reminder, this Solarize project is for the Helena area, but people who are in outlying um, cities like, like East Helena, Montana City, 
sort of the, the valley area, all that's within this, this range of this project. So anybody who's interested in that area, uh, please uh, be involved. And if you're outside that area, that just means that there are other installers uh, from other places that will be um, within range. Uh, if you're in, I don't know, Lincoln or uh, Butte or someplace, um, you can still get all of this, all of this attention. But the Solarize campaign is just to try to get people in the Helena area to do a lot of this information gathering all at once and hopefully do the installations uh, sort of in a big wad so that we can uh, take advantage of, of the uh, economies of scale. So uh, we'll share all the links from tonight's webinar and additional information by a follow-up email. Um, thank you, I think that's gonna do it. I think we almost hit the bar at eight o'clock. This has been really great. There's always um, more. And if anybody wants to volunteer with the, the Sleeping Giant Citizens Council, we'd appreciate that. Otherwise, thank you and good night. <laughs>